We will sell ourselves basically um, to make money. At 13 years old, this became Kayla's life. High heels, short skirts, nights in the back of cars and hotel rooms. A man she was forced to call daddy. If I don't have $1,500 a night, um, I will get abused. I will get slapped, I will get punched in my face. We've hidden her face and given her the fake name of Kayla to protect her identity. Kayla's story didn't start on the streets. That's where she ended up. Nasty, dirty things happen to you in a system and foster care. Um, even on in a group home, I was molested, I was raped. Lost and confused, Kayla found her escape in what she thought was a friend in a similar situation. What she didn't know, the more experienced teen was a recruiter, leading her straight into a life of human trafficking. She dressed me up in a mini skirt, some high heel shoes. She told me, that, you know, that this is daddy, this is not my boyfriend. At 13 years old. At 13 years old. For the next decade, Kayla worked on the streets across the state, including the boulevard right here in San Diego. Unfortunately, Kayla's story is not uncommon. The vast majority of women who are quote unquote like in prostitution are victims of human trafficking. Grace Williams is the head of Children of the Immaculate Heart. The nonprofit was founded to help people who are vulnerable due to human trafficking. The statistics are that it's the second largest illegal industry worldwide and that matches locally and it's the fastest growing. You can sell a woman or a girl over and or a boy, you know, over and over and over again. Team 10 discovered an increase in the number of prostitution and solicitation citations and arrests made by the San Diego Police Department. In 2018, those numbers were up more than 30% from the year before, reaching 185 arrests and citations for crimes related to prostitution. Most police activity centering on Hotel Circle South, El Cajon Boulevard, and Main Street near National City. One advocate tells me the increase is because law enforcement was out on more pre-planned operations. But the increase also comes the same year one of the largest internet classified ad sites, Backpage, was seized by the government. Do you see any correlation between Backpage.com shutting down and people being exploited on the streets again? It's too early to say, but taking down the largest purveyor of sex over the internet had to have some impact. But as I said, someone's always looking for ways to make a buck. Javier Becerra is the Attorney General of California. He calls human trafficking modern day slavery. I've got three daughters. I see how this infects so many of our families. We've already taken down several sex rings. Uh, these are young kids who've ta had their life taken away. Becerra says recent changes to the laws allow prosecutors to go after pimps criminally. He says the state has the authority to prosecute trafficking rings, something he and his team are actively doing. You combat it by going after the source, the pimps. You're dressed a certain way. Kayla says she walked the streets and was forced to plaster her face in online ads. I've slept with probably over, you know, 3,000 guys. She was beaten, raped, drugged, called a prostitute, a hooker. Now she's called a survivor. Looking at it now, is there something that you would have told your younger self at that time? Run as fast as you can. And this was built in 1937. If these walls could talk, the stories they might tell. These are all my grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I love them all. <laughs> the complex tapestry of one woman's life well lived. So I live here by myself. Making it on her own after her husband died. Betty Morse moved into this tiny ocean beach cottage back in the late 80s. She needed a place she could afford. The rent back then, a little more than a hundred bucks. It was a beautiful place to live so you could walk to the ocean and watch the sunset, you know, at night, which I did all the time. Now a fixture in the neighborhood, she's even hosted the mayor and his mother. She said, Kevin, I want a picture of Betty with you. <laughs> and he said, okay, mom. <laughs> and he came over to the tip and she said, 
She's very unsteady on her feet. Kevin, don't let her fall. <laughs> During her 30 years here, Betty says she's never had a problem with the rental. No real complaints or maintenance needs. The rent always paid on time. That's a trait Betty picked up from the one man she's ever loved. Before he died, when he was in ICU, he had a tube. But he wrote, don't forget to pay the rent. <laughs> this year, Betty says she was asked to sign a new rental agreement. But her family had some disagreements with a couple of changes made by the landlord. They say after a few back and forth with their attorney, this arrived. A 90-day notice terminating her tenancy. Where do you go if you can't stay here? I don't know. I don't know who will rent to me because I'm in two months I'll be 99. And they're not going to be happy to rent an apartment. Betty's using Section 8 federal housing assistance to help cover the rent. She says she waited 12 years for that help. You know, the termination notice says the owner is electing to opt out of the Section 8 program. They want to renovate the unit and then rent it at a higher rental value, market rate. They clearly state on their 90 day notice that their just cause is because they don't want to cooperate with Section 8. Pamela Macias runs an eviction solutions company. She's working with Betty and her family to try and keep her in her home. She's even willing to pay market rent, and just for no reason at all, they want her out. The San Diego Housing Commission says there are more than 6,000 landlords participating in the Section 8 program. Most don't usually stop, but it does happen. At the moment, landlords are not required to accept tenants who receive Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Rental Assistance. However, that is changing next summer. The San Diego City Council passed new protections, saying landlords cannot decline a tenant based only on the household receiving rental assistance. It opens large opportunities for our clients to receive um, assistance and utilize their voucher in the city of San Diego. It allows our clients to maintain affordable housing and find affordable housing. It will help others, but at this point, not Betty. She does have a place to stay. Betty can move in with her kids. But nearing the century mark, she worries about being a burden. But I don't want to be in a nursing home either, you know. I still want to be independent. This little place by the beach that fits Betty so well was supposed to be her last stop. See, I figured that I now lived a wonderful life in Ocean Beach, and I want to live and die here, you know. Because I feel so comfortable here. It's my little house. It's all I know. A pat on the back. A comforting cuddle on the couch. These are small moments that can help shape a child's life. We can't show you this infant because she's a foster child whose identity needs to stay secret. But here's the woman who's opened her heart and home to rescue this baby and dozens of other foster kids. If we don't do it, who else will? This is Rhonda Oliver. A lot of people don't like to get up in the night with newborns, but I do. I, I compare it to my zen. Rhonda's a former Child Protective Services employee and has a law enforcement background. So you've seen the worst of the worst? Yes, yes, definitely. And decided to do something about it? What I could do, yeah. What Rhonda did is devote her life to foster kids. This is the 46th child she and her husband have fostered. They only take drug-exposed infants. Most of the newborns they pick up straight from the hospital. If something happened to that child, be it in this household or another household, and that child lost their life, would you want everyone, everyone involved looking at it to see what happened? Absolutely, without a doubt. Team 10 discovered that might not necessarily be happening. See, counties in California are required to report when a foster child is the victim of abuse or neglect or when they've been killed or nearly killed because of abuse or neglect. That makes sense. But there are other kids who die in foster care who don't fall into those categories. We asked the Department of Social Services for the total number of deaths of children in foster care. Their answer, 
the department does not maintain data regarding all deaths in foster care. They told us statistics regarding all deaths are maintained by the California Department of Public Health. But that department told us they don't specifically track foster care. Even if it's not from abuse or neglect, what are they dying from? Exactly what? Exactly how it could be prevented? Every single death should have a, a commission inquiry into it, I think. Robert Felmuth is the head of the Children's Advocacy Institute at the University of San Diego. The organization works to improve the lives of kids in the foster system. There are children in a democracy, our children, I mean yours and mine and the audience and everybody. Each county in California is required to keep track of every foster child that dies while in its custody. Using open records laws, Team 10 collected the total number of children that died while residing in foster placement from all 58 counties in the state since 2010. Turns out it's not just one or two kids that died. It's 263. Take a second and think about that. More than 200 kids. Most of them, you'll never know their names, never know what they looked like. Should the news have to create a database that shows how many kids died in the state of California while in foster care? No, the news should not have to create any kind of database. This should be something that is affirmatively examined constantly, every year. Every time there's a death, it should be a big deal. State Representative Brian Mainshine agrees. Absolutely. In order to make decisions, you have to have the data. We showed him the numbers we collected and the state's response to our questions. He says it's time to make a change. Actions can be taken at the state level. Next session, uh, I intend to uh, bring forth some legislation that would require counties to report. Rhonda doesn't make policy. She's never lost a child, but knows the pain that others who have suffered. Here's something else she knows. In watching that child just gain weight, be able to eat, be able to smile, be able to coo, those are things that, you know, for me, that's, that's my... That's my passion. That's my give back. You're resisting right now? This cell phone video only lasts about a minute, but what it captures is the moment life changed for everyone involved. That's a little, that's a little excessive. The guy face down on the ground is Tomas de Leon. So they're holding his head down on the ground, kicking him, um, kneeing him, hitting him. Over and over again, and my brother's just laying there, not doing anything. Yeah, he's not resisting. This is Tomas's sister, Marlene. It looked like he got beat up. Like a whole bunch of guys punched him in the face. Marlene says physical injuries aside, Tomas is suffering emotionally. Since his encounter with deputies outside of this North County Wendy's in 2016, Tomas has become isolated, rarely leaving the house. Marlene wanted to share his story, hoping to get answers to these questions. What did he do to deserve that why why did he get beat up I wanted to know what happened according to court documents Tomas was on his bike when deputies stopped him the video doesn't show what happened before it starts with him on the ground he produced his identification um, a brief conversation took place and then the next thing was uh, he was thrown to the ground Brian Klein is the De Leon family's attorney he says deputies claim at some point Tomas De Leon resisted arrest De Leon is suing the county, sheriff, and arresting deputies, alleging excessive force. In the lawsuit, it says once on the ground, Tomas was handcuffed, offered no resistance, and then violently beaten. Yeah, he's not resisting. If you've ever seen a professional fight at the point where they stop the fight because it's gotten too violent, this is where it started, and then they continued. The sheriff's department wouldn't talk to us about this case or the deputies involved. They declined our interview request. They did, however, file this court document asking the case be dismissed. It alleges De Leon didn't comply with the state's rules and file a claim with the county, among other things. It's important to know court records show a person by the name of Tomas De Leon has had several run-ins with law enforcement. But he's not the only one who's been investigated. Deputies have personnel files. They're files that you and I would never get to see. But if it gets brought up during a court hearing, it can become part of the public record. That's what this is. It's a transcript from a court hearing on a different case where Deputy Kyle Klein had to testify about whether he conducted an illegal search and seizure. According to the transcript, Klein's had run-ins with internal affairs for inaccurate report writing and excessive force. But according to the transcript, Klein had issues with being truthful before he even joined the department. According to what's documented in the court transcript, Klein applied to the Riverside County Sheriff's Department before San Diego County but Riverside passed on him. 
In the transcript, it summarizes how he flunked a polygraph when he applied to Riverside County at least a decade ago. The transcript says during a polygraph exam, Klein was asked, are you now or have you ever been associated with a white supremacist organization? Klein answered no. He was then asked if that's one of the questions to which deception was indicated. He answered, yeah, that's what it says, yes. That is an instant red flag, and that is, an, in my opinion, sometimes even a, an instant disqualifier. Dave Myers is a former commander with the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. We asked him to read through the transcript. He says if other departments pass on candidates in a pre-hire background investigation, it's another red flag to look into why. And if the department really, really wanted to hire this person because they were, they were such a spectacular hire, I mean, that would have had to been, should have been extremely vetted um, because that's, in, in, in my experience, is not the type of candidate we would want in law enforcement. You know, when I talk about it, it brings up a lot of bad feelings. Marlene says the incident has been hard on their family. She says she just wants to see her brother happy, something he struggled with. You mentioned justice. Do you think you'll get justice? Do you hope? I hope. I hope. <laughs> He's the most amazing thing that happened to us. After years of trying, followed by a difficult pregnancy, in late 2016, Maria Rique and her husband met their miracle son, Daniel Alejandro. But due to health concerns, Daniel was delivered early at 31 weeks. He weighed only three pounds. When I gave birth, the doctor told me, don't worry, you're not going to even see the baby because a team of doctors are waiting for him in, in the NICU. Maria had preeclampsia and her blood pressure was dangerously high for her and the baby. The baby can die or I can go into coma and then the baby can live. So it's either or. The decision was easy. Treat mother and baby separately. Deliver the baby early. The two survived delivery, but Maria's blood pressure was still elevated. The doctor prescribed her a blood pressure medication. They filled it at a CVS down the street from the hospital. A day later, she was feeling worse. I was in the NICU with my baby, and then I completely black out. Maria says her blood pressure skyrocketed to life-threatening levels. Maria had the right medication, but says the pharmacy gave her the wrong dosage. Instead of the 400 milligram pill she says the doctor prescribed, she got 100 milligram, a fourth of what she needed to be there for her son. Did you ever think that a pharmacy would make a mistake like that? I, I never thought of that before. It's not something that, that is uncommon. I just think it's not often reported. Brandon Smith is Maria's lawyer. He's not wrong. We checked. Team 10 spent weeks sifting through disciplinary and enforcement actions taken against pharmacists and pharmacies. We discovered the California State Board of Pharmacy issues hundreds of citations to pharmacists each year for prescription errors. But those errors are only what the state knows about. In California, pharmacies are not required to report a prescription error. So we think that their time is better spent really focusing on what led to the error and to correct the error and to train around the error so it doesn't reoccur, making the marketplace safer. Virginia Herald is the executive officer at the California State Board of Pharmacy. She's been with the board for nearly three decades. Herald says the board relies on consumer complaints and court settlements to identify wrongdoings. It can and does investigate and discipline. She tells me pharmacies are required to keep records of all dispensing errors. After a mistake, the pharmacy must initiate a quality assurance review. They're required to keep that record for a year. As we strongly believe that pharmacists do not deliberately make errors. If they do, that would be a formal disciplinary matter and we would move very quickly to remove them from practice. In a statement, a spokesperson for CVS tells Team 10, prescription errors are a very rare occurrence. But if one happens, they determine what happened in order to prevent it from occurring again. They've apologized to the Gamboa family regarding this incident. Do you think about it now, every time you fill a prescription? Of course, every time. Maria recovered, but says her breast milk supply suddenly stopped as a result. Daniel was too young for formula. They had to rely on donor milk to keep him alive. He's a little bigger now, but Maria says she's still haunted by the thought she could have missed his smiles, his laughs, his first steps. After everything, after all that happened, 
leave him without his mom? I mean, just by thinking of that, it get, gets me worse. We can't show you the kids in these pictures. We can't tell you their names. That information's confidential to protect their identities. But that same confidentiality that's in place to protect them may also be protecting a child welfare system some believe failed them. My children are gonna have to live a lifetime trying to get over and deal with this trauma. This is Melanie. She's the woman in the pictures. She's the adoptive mother to most of these kids. Melanie's also a foster parent. I became a foster parent because I did want to make a difference in children's lives that didn't have families. Melanie says she became a foster parent about a decade ago. She wanted to give children in need a safe, loving home. They all play sports, so just watching them grow and advance in life is just probably the biggest joy. But Melanie says a foster placement back in 2015 ripped that joy right out of the home. One of these prospective adopted children end up sexually assaulting all three of Melanie's adopted sons. Jomo Stewart is Melanie's lawyer. They filed this lawsuit against the County of San Diego, several county employees, and a national foundation that focuses on foster care. It claims Melanie was told a foster child had no history of sexual misconduct or any history of wrongdoing. The suit claims social services concealed the child's past issues and put the other kids in unreasonable harm. She asked social services whether or not these children had any type of mental health issues, had any previous history of being sexually abused, or any um, previous history of sexually acting out. And all answers to, that, to those questions were no. Court documents claim about a month after taking the child into her home, the child began to act out. There were incidents of smearing feces on the wall and downloading and watching pornography. Then things escalated. The suit claims there were several incidents of sexual and physical violence against the other children in the home over the next year. Some so graphic, we can't repeat the details. Even rape, the victim traumatized, still in counseling, trying to deal with it. After each incident, Melanie says she reached out to county social services employees seeking help. Sometimes there was no response at all. Sometimes uh, they said that they were going to place a report. I'd follow up on the report. I wouldn't get any, any information. This is not an isolated incident, Adam. I, I think that if you were to pull uh, the foster parents in the, in the county of San Diego, this would be very common. Which part? What's common is the lack of action by many social workers. The county wouldn't do an on-camera interview with us. However, they did respond to the lawsuit in a 25-page court filing asking that it be dismissed. It says the records in the county's possession at the time the child was placed in the home didn't have any information that would have alerted them that the child may pose a risk of harm. They also claim there are no factual allegations to support that they failed to take appropriate action. After each incident, they did take action by filing a report and commencing an investigation. Is it surprising to you to see allegations like this against San Diego County and the foster system? No, no, the, the foster system, not just in San Diego County, but statewide, is completely and totally broken. This very situation is something Sean McMillan's seen before. He's a San Diego attorney that specializes in child welfare cases, one of only a handful in the state. We asked him to read the lawsuit and the county's response. McMillan says one of the biggest problems in the system, everything is done in secret. I've dealt with San Diego County for a long time. These specific attorneys that are defending this case, I have cases with them right now. And it's typical to see what they're doing here. There, it's blame assignment, denial, um, a refusal to be held accountable. Eventually, in fear of everyone's safety, Melanie took action to return the child to the county's care. According to Melanie's lawsuit, the district attorney's office filed felony delinquency charges against that child for sexual abuse. Melanie says had she known the child's history, there's no way the placement would have taken place. My children are going to have to live a lifetime trying to get over and deal with this trauma.